our careers with the huge variety of landscape processes that we came across day to day. Before morning tea, after morning tea, after lunch, we'd see three different types of landscapes. Farmers having similar problems, but the drivers for those problems being quite different, and therefore the recommended actions for them being quite different. And we all, everyone who's been in the field of salinity in Eastern Australia goes through a certain time where they think it's all too bloody complicated. And then you see enough complication that you start to see some patterns, right? You start to see these recurring patterns in the landscape driven by the landscape themselves. And that's what Alan will particularly talk about after morning tea. Okay. Um, salinity has an impact on my day-to-day -day land management. Most people didn't agree with that. Okay. So, so maybe that means that it's not occurring on many people's places or that it's not something that we can internalise on what we do day to day. And, and that's one of the things I'm going to talk about particularly is what are the day to day kitchen table decisions we can make that are about salinity. Okay? Um, and I know a farm which demonstrates successful salinity management. Two people really knew a farm and most people didn't. So. Um, I've got an enormous amount of pictures of farms that demonstrate that in that magic box there. So we'll talk about that. Okay. Right. Um, I think the topic on the agenda that I'm talking about is the hydrology of the central tablelands, but that's pretty bland. Uh, I asked the people down the front what they thought that was a picture of. It's a vaguely familiar pattern. Um, and most people, when I ask them that question, they say something like, it looks like a leaf or an aerial shot or, what did you say, a small intestine, <laughs> right? It's a vaguely familiar pattern uh, and it's actually a, a, a chaos mathematics algorithm, right? It's a, it's a fractal pattern, it's a fractal algorithm. And, and one of the things is that if you get up really, really close to this pattern, you can't see it, right? It looks too chaotic, but if you stand back a bit, you start to see the sweep of that pattern and you can start to compartmentalise it. And when we're dealing with something that's as awe-inspiring and complicated and powerful as the Australian landscape, it's very similar. There are things that if you, sometimes if you're up very close, this pattern seems too chaotic and you can't understand what's going on. But sometimes when you've got a bit of a, uh, a benefit of hindsight, a bit of benefit of perspective, or the benefit of seeing hundreds of these small patterns over and over again and getting paid by the state government to do it, then you start to see the pattern. Okay, so Nico and I come to you today with a combined uh, nearly 60 years of experience of looking at dry land salinity issues most days of our working lives, of seeing people be confronted by them on their farms, in their towns, in their irrigation farms, and overcoming those things. And at the guts of those successes is an understanding of the landscape and how it's actually working, and there be, therefore being able to plug in the right management on top of that, okay? So we need to talk a little bit about a landscape that didn't have salt and didn't have erosion. What did it look like? The landscape seemed to work 200 or so years ago in this part of the world when we had a high component of perennial plants in the landscape, right? When we had Vegetation communities that had high diversity, lots of diversity. And particularly when we had soils which had organic matter layers, which soil scientists and agriculturalists call A0 horizons or A1 horizons. Okay? What's changed? In agricultural landscapes particularly, we've annualised the landscape. Our major food production and grazing Plants are annual plants. Big change. Um, we've simplified it. We've changed a diverse landscape where if you walked 100 metres you'd see 60 to 100 species to something where if you walk 100 metres you might see five species. Okay? And big thing is our soils have changed dramatically. We've lost our organic matter layers in the surface and we've lost the structure in our upper layers. And that means for a big chunk of the central tablelands in central west of New South Wales, there was a sponge about this thick on top of the ground that's now not there anymore. 
okay? It's gone. And that has a huge impact on the way the landscape behaves. So we start breaking down the water cycle. What has changed in the water cycle with uh, agricultural development? We've changed things like evapotranspiration, water leaving the land and going to the atmosphere, okay? We've changed that dramatically. We talk about how much water evaporates from the soil surface and we talk about how much is actually used by plants. What's the transpiration? For salinity, we spend a lot of time talking about uh, uh, words like deep drainage or groundwater recharge. And, and for the purposes of our talks this morning, we're going to focus that this word called deep drainage or recharge, it means that water gets past the root zone of whatever's there. Does that make sense? Yep. Um, if we were in a room full of hydrologists, or even worse, hydrogeologists, we'd spend the first half hour arguing about that definition. But for today, uh, I should, should mention that I've got a little farm near Canoundra. Um, so for today, what I think about when I'm walking around my paddocks is if the plants don't get the water, it becomes recharge. Okay? Right. Um, it's a pretty vinely balanced process. Uh, how many creeks had water in them today as you drove here? And how many of them had water in them uh, in December? Right? Now the ones that had water in them in December, fair chunk of that was groundwater. Okay? Because it wasn't runoff. It's a pretty finely balanced process. Surface water. We talk about runoff. We talk about water running across the top of the landscape, entering our drainage system. Um, and it's just worth reflecting on runoff. Uh, we have, a, we have a, a phrase we call field capacity. And what that is, is it's how much water you can fit into a soil. Right? Now, different soils have different capacities to hold water. So one way that surface water runoff occurs is because the rainfall is greater than the field, greater than the field capacity. So the soil is saturated and there's no more room for water to go in. Okay? Now, that's one reason we get runoff. The other reason, which is by far the most common, is about when the rainfall rate is greater than the soil infiltration rate. The rain is turning up quicker than it can go in. Right? And for those of you who want to test this, go and dig a hole after a dry spell when you've had 20 mils. <laughs> how, how far before you hit dust? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right? That's this issue, isn't it? Yep. Yeah. So the way I like to talk about this is when we talk about why is runoff occurring, is it because the room's not big enough? We don't have enough capacity, or is it because the door that goes into the room is shut? Right? That's the reason we have runoff. It's either because greater than field capacity or greater than infiltration rate. Right. Good. We've seen both in the last few weeks. Yeah, yeah. I would still suggest strongly that if we dug a lots of holes, we'd be hitting dust at 40 to 60 centimetres. Yep. Has anyone dug a hole this week? Where did it get dry? It got dry about down four inches. Oh wow. But the interesting thing was it was then dry dust, completely dry, and then it had below that depth. Right. And what do you think that was? Right. Okay. Okay, so we have evidence that the door is shut. Okay? Right? Now the the good news from our grazing manager point of view or a farmer point of view, we can really change that door size. Okay? It's hard. Hmm? Why was the water underneath the dry dust? Who's got an idea about that? Why did you find damp soil down under the dust? Well, it's interesting. In the ground. What might water be called that's in under the ground? Groundwater. Groundwater. Okay? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, the and, and I would guess that you didn't find many roots in it. No, you're right. <laughs> yep, okay. Uh, 
So um, we also need to talk about the other way that water moves through the landscape. We've talked about it going straight down. We've talked about it running off. But there's also this thing in the middle, which some scientists call through flow, shallow flow, lateral flow or interflow. And if the recharge argument was going to take half an hour, this is going to take three days. Right? For our perspectives, it's just not all water flows straight down and some of it loosely mimics the landscape. Do people have springs that appear halfway up the hill in wet winters? That's this stuff. It's water going in, hitting something and moving sideways. Okay? So if you have got a landscape that's got lots of solid rock, you'll probably have a fair bit of this. If you've got a landscape that's very deep with soil and lots of gravelly rock, you mightn't have too much of this. Okay? Then we talk about groundwater discharge, water coming to the surface. It's a natural process. The creeks that were running in December wouldn't be there if it wasn't for groundwater discharge. Right? They're groundwater fed creeks. When we have maybe too much groundwater discharge, we get salinity. We get salty water coming to the surface, usually away from creeks, and creating salt patches. And I'll talk a lot more about that. Okay? Finally, balanced process. Recharge, water going in. Discharge, water going out. Runoff, water flowing across the top. We play around with those in our day-to-day -day actions as land managers. Right? We partition water in the landscape because of how we manage the landscape. And that will have different implications for different people depending on the size of the room. Right? How much water can we store in the landscape? Alan and I, uh, a couple of months ago, were sitting on a relatively flat landscape at Lake Kajeligay. Right? Um, recharge had been occurring there for about 80 years and it took 80 years for it to hit the surface. And when it did, wow, two-thirds sea water coming out of a wheat paddock. Okay? Um, Alan, in his professional life, has seen landscapes be cleared close to uh, Dunny Doo and the bucket filled up and started leaking in about four or five years, right? Different size bucket, different size storage of water, okay? Now, how do we influence that? We can influence it by the soil biology, okay? How much, you can, how much water you can store in a soil is really influenced by the soil biology. And we can also influence it with soil structure the physical structure of the soil really changes how much water we can store in a soil. Right? If we cultivate the bejesus out of a soil, we take the structure out of it, which means less space. Less space for water, less space for air, less space for, for bugs, for biology. Okay? Right, so um, a guy who had a big influence on both Alan and I's careers is a guy called Baden Williams, former CSIRO scientist. Uh, he had worked, he had worked like us for departments of issues. <laughs> okay, when we first started, we worked for the soil erosion department. We worked for the Soil Conservation Service, and then we were employed by the New South Wales Salt Action Program. We worked for the salinity issue. You know, um, but they are all just symptoms of how we're managing our soil. Okay, and, and Baden, uh, the, the only strategy to, to restore ecological function and hydrology function is soil profile, right? It's the sponge, it's the transmitter, it's the storer, it's the medium for growing things. That's where we should put our efforts. Okay, right, so what has changed in that hydrogeology, hydrology space since Weiss settlement, besides everything? Besides everything, okay, <laughs> um, we've changed runoff characteristics, right? We've changed recharge rates. We've changed soil water storage. We've changed evapotranspiration. We've changed the way plants use water. And we've changed the amount of bare soil, meaning that we've changed the way 
that um, soil water evaporates. Okay? So we've, we've done some big things. I want you to turn to the person next to you and in three minutes, which is about, 20, uh, about 30 seconds per each one of these, I want you to say, recharge your deep drainage. Is it higher before white people or higher now? Runoff, higher or lower? Interflow or through flow, higher or lower? Groundwater discharge, higher or lower? Soil water store, higher or lower? Right? Turn to your neighbour and see which ones you reckon are higher and which ones are lower. I'll give you three minutes. So one of the tricks of doing the sort of work that Al and I have done for a long time is that, yes, there is always exceptions to the rule. We are tiny little humans in a great big universe, right? <laughs> yes. And, and um, the interesting thing from when we work with lots of other disciplines of people who come from a very strong geology background, a very strong water background, um, the farmer doesn't care, right? The farmer has a problem in their farm and they want it fixed. But a lot of scientists or technical people turn up and they're really determined that what they know the most about is the most important thing for that farmer. People, people sort of experience that? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so of course, um, I think I'll show a slide later about if you are a hammer, everything looks like a nail. But the universe is complicated, right? Um, as a general sweeping generalisation, <laughs> this is what's going on, okay? This is what tends to be going on in, in central west New South Wales, right? Um, we have lower evapotranspiration because we've changed the vegetation communities, right? We've changed them. If you look at some of the cropping paddocks towards Ralston and Mudgee, they have incredibly large water use for about nine to 12 weeks during the wheat growing season, and then they have no water use, okay? So over the year, that paddock's actually got less water use, right, even though they're growing Magnificent crops and all that sort of stuff. Recharge tends to be increased, right? Because there's not, we've, what we've done is we've changed the plant water use bit of that. And we've changed the soil water storage bit of that. So water goes through. Gravity works, okay? Most of the time. But that's counterintuitive to me. I thought we saw a compaction in the runoff, more going less. Yep. Runoff occurs as well. Runoff has increased, right? Gravity never sleeps. Gravity never sleeps. And one of the things that can happen with the situation you're talking about, compacted soil, runoff from one part of the landscape gets to another part of the landscape. Doesn't get used there, in it goes. Yep, gravity works, mostly. Haven't, we haven't been to a site where it hasn't worked yet. Uh, runoff. There's a bit more of it, but there's also higher energy in the water that does run off. That's the big difference. The amount of energy that's in that water. Right? And that's got a lot to do with the situation you're talking about. We have rainstorms hitting tin roofs, not mulch. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Yep. If, if, if a raindrop yeah. falls out of the sky, hits some mulch, sure. half the energy has gone. Yeah. If it hits bare soil, the energy, most of the energy is still intact. It works on the dirt, smashes the dirt to bits, starts travelling downhill. Yeah. So we end up, when that times a million, we end up with all those raindrops hitting the same spot at the same time with much more energy. More energy means they can pick up more stuff, rip more stuff, take more stuff. <laughs> Right? We're the same rainfall event onto our landscape, which is mainly mulch, yep. mainly living and dead material. Same amount of rain, same amount of runoff, turns up over days, weeks, other than hours. Yep. And that has some big implications for when it hits our main gutters, 
our main creek systems. Yep, because they bear the brunt of all of that energy joined together. Interflow and through flow, slightly higher. We're getting slightly more of that, right? And the reason is we've changed our dirt, we've wrecked the soil structure, uh, and we also have mid-slope gullies, right? We have these gullies that go right up into paddocks, up the sides of the hills, which give an opportunity for that interflow, that shallow flow to come out. Right? We, we've drained the landscape, and in many ways, We'd have heaps more salt visible in this part of the world if it wasn't for those beautiful gullies because they're letting the water out. Okay? You know, what's better or worse around? Things are out of balance. Um, groundwater discharge. We've got more of it. Right? Finite amount of water, partitioning it in the landscape. We've put a bit more in as recharge. We've changed our soil water store. Right? We made it... There's less of a sponge to hold it close to the plants for longer. Now it goes through because gravity pushes it. Um, we have more areas where we can have, uh, like mid-slope gullies, where we can have more salt. And we have um, slowly expanding saline land at the bottom of lots of hills. And our soil and biological water store is much lower. We've smashed our soil organic matter layers from 6 to 10% down to 1 to 2%. General sweeping generalisation, there's all differences to it. Um, we've wrecked our soil biology and, and people who have gone into places that are undeveloped uh, for agriculture and, and done a bit of a soil food web and worked out the, the, the ratio between bacteria, fungi, mycorrhiza, protozoa, um, they, they walk out into the paddocks and they find a very different story. Okay? Um. <laughs> <laughs> I've got... Uh, we won't run late. Annie will make sure we won't run late. <laughs> so we've lost the mulch layers and we've got a smaller sponge. Okay. So the land use and the climate influence the water balance, right? And this new word regolith, the regolith characteristics influence the salinity processes. Right? There's a lot of technical words in there. Regolith is everything from Solid rock to fresh air. It's stuff we might call dirt, rotten rock, gravels. If water can fit in there, it's regolith. The characteristics of the regolith influence the salinity processes. What do I mean by that? That's a salinity process. Okay? That's a what might happen in a certain situation where you have a Soil that lets water in quite quickly, which we call a high permeability soil. Somewhere down here we have a, a subsoil texture change. It becomes more clay or the clay becomes heavier, which means that water and salt perch close to the surface. Right? That's a process. Here's another one, very different, where you might have a landscape where the whole hill lets water through as recharge. It hits some sort of impermeable layer and we get a saline discharge site, not at the lowest point in the landscape, but at the point where that permeability changes. Right? These are all descriptions of components of plumbing in the landscape. This is one that happens quite commonly, where you have a wet damp layer at depth. Right? It might be a bit salty and you might tell it's a bit salty because it's got no plant roots in it. Right? We get some rain and this whole soil profile gets wet and the salt starts to wick up, right? meaning the salt that was spread through this part of the landscape is now concentrated in that part. Right? That's another process. It occurs quite regularly. So, Nico will talk a lot about this. We start lumping those processes together in patterns which are familiar and we start recognising that there are in certain situations, it's more, much more likely that you'll have a certain group of those processes than not, right? And we call that a landscape. And, and for Alan's talk, we call that a hydrogeological landscape. So we might have a series of things occurring in a pattern in the landscape driven by the plumbing that's under the ground, which is the rocks and the structure and that sort of stuff. And that changes dramatically, right? Those two examples I've just shown you 
can both be on the same farm. Okay? Very different types of processes. Alan will spend a lot of time talking about this. Right? So when we, we have a huge variety of salinity processes, um, the Central Table Lands LLS staff sat in this room two winters ago and we spent the morning talking about different salinity processes. Right? And I'd only focused on the ones that I thought would occur around here. There's, there's hundreds of them. Okay? When you start putting them together, if what's mainly going to occur in a landscape, we start calling that a hydrogeological landscape. Alan's talk after morning tea will cover that. I'm so sorry to ask such a simple question. No such thing. Um, but what is the salt? Is it actually just sodium or is it many other... Like is it You've answered your own question. It is many salts as we learnt about them in year eight. Remember what salts were? <laughs> no. no. <laughs> hey, it's a pretty basic question, yeah. but are all salts deemed to be bad? Right. Uh, concentration's the issue. Yeah, concentration is the issue. Yes, there are many different types of salt. Okay. And he's going to do an exercise after morning tea and you're going to make the water that's in some of the creeks around here. We'll be using a mixture of sodium bicarbonate, Sodium chloride and nanocellular helper, magnesium carbonate. Right. Yeah. Mm. Okay. So are all soils equally salty? No. No. So not all areas the landscape history and the plumbing defines how salty a soil is. The plumbing also defines how much water pushes how much salt is around. The land use defines how much water gets there. Yes. Ignoring the permeability aspect, yes. it gets out. Yes. Yes, by factors. And on farms around here, Alan and I have done work where we can do a soil test and get a certain number, walk maybe 400 metres, do another soil test, and get a number that's 100 times more salt. Right? right? Yep. So the variation within the landscape is important, and the variation between Ralston and Warren is also important. Yep. Have so many parts per million, yep. or you know, three kilometres up the road, they got sweet water. Yeah. Is that a function of the salt that's in the soil, or is that a separate thing? Right. Uh, not every every time you hit a salty or a fresh bore, doesn't necessarily mean that the dirt on top of that is salty or fresh, mm -hmm. because it's about the connection between the two. Okay. So if there's no water at the surface and you dig a bore, and it bubbles up the pipe. By definition, it's not connected to the surface. So it's all of those sorts of issues come in. In general, if you have lots of shallow groundwater that is salty, you will see lots of salty soils. Shallow being 15 metres. And it's mm. the rock around here um, at the higher or lower end of the salty spectrum in terms of... It is yeah. both. <laughs> it is both. <laughs> yep. And we will walk this afternoon from fresh rocks to dirty rocks. Yep. So, um, what do we do about it? There's usually a simple answer to most complicated problems and it's usually wrong. Okay. The first thing we need to do, I should say that if you can understand the next 15 minutes of the talk, you are vastly overqualified to be the Minister for the Environment or Agriculture in New South Wales. <laughs> okay. Um, and you certainly couldn't be the Director General of the Water Department in New South Wales. Um, but it's these issues you're bringing up are very real. And when it comes to people like ourselves and the Central Table Lands LLS, they're really hard as well. All right? We're going to talk about three issues. And in the paddock this afternoon, we're actually going to talk about these three issues. Right? The three issues are, Minister, salinity is three different things. <laughs> it is salt land. It is salt land that's export, salt load that is exported in water and it is salinity concentration in that water, right? Now, by now, every minister I've ever dealt with is just rolling back. Their eyes are just gone. Right, here's an example of salt land. It's near Yass, okay? Um, it's eroding. The water table has come to the surface. You can see the salt, right? Salt wrecks the dirt, doesn't let the plants grow, which means that, that area becomes much more uh, susceptible to erosion, right? 
what does salt land look like in some of the upper catchments of the Lachlan, Macquarie uh, and the Hawkesbury is that we get lots of erosion gullies where there's a bit of a salt influence and we get this beautiful little negative feedback loop, right? Salt turns up one day, kills the grass, which means that the next time a small amount of rain runs across that landscape, what happens? Erosion. Erosion. Lowers the landscape. Liberates more salt. Kills more grass. <laughs> right? Rotate, rotate, rotate. So on this particular site and like sites like it, we know that this site would be yielding between two and five tonnes of salt per hectare per year, right? Be going into the creek. At the same time, it's yielding about 20 to 50 tonnes of dirt into the creek, okay? So the Department of Erosion was really interested in these sites from a pure, where's the sediment coming point, point of view. But one of the drivers of that is this groundwater salinity process. Okay, good. Um, very different type of landscape. Just near the Cowra Airport, right? Incredibly high value land irrigatable, um, salt popping up, loosen, can cope with salt and waterlogging for a while, sooner or later, dies. Right. What's the time, Annie? 10 o'clock. Thank you very much. We won't run late. <laughs> okay, just over near Mumble between Wellington and Mudgee, right? Salt land is incredibly subjective. Bob Carr wanted to make it go away, spent a lot of money. Uh, Bob Carr left, the money left. Salt's not important anymore, right? Um, in this part of the world, a, a grazier is considered to be on top of his game if he's running between four and eight DSE, four and eight sheep per hectare. This is a grazing farm, big salt patch through the middle of it. Classic discharge salinity issue. Um, total size is probably about five hectares. So one way we could look at that picture, and some people do, is say, oh, okay, so missing 15 sheep. <laughs> okay? Yep. When wool was worth nothing, 15 sheep times nothing equals nothing. When we're getting 10 bucks for dodgy wool, 15 sheep, oh yeah, it's significant, right? But this same photo, that creek, right? That creek is five kilometres in a straight line from um, Burundong Dam, right? I bet you that salt's not there this morning. It's, it's in the dam. So subjectively, all of a sudden, we start thinking, oh, it's the sheep aren't actually the problem. It's where that salt's going, right? And salt land is very much like that. Farm near Cowra, salt patch in a wheat paddock. Salt wasn't there when he sowed the wheat. Had a wet winter, water table came up, killed the wheat. What's the biggest drama for that farmer? Oh, because of the way my paddock's set up, I can't actually drive the header across there to harvest that wheat. Right? Because I get bogged. Right? Different value about the same process. Uh, sometimes I'm paid to be Dream Crushers Incorporated. That's an area of land between Warren and Nevertire where the landholder thought he was going to set up another irrigation enterprise. Uh, and the guy who owns that hat is paid as his agricultural consultant on retainer. And he rang me one day and said, uh, I need you to come and say the unsayable to this guy, which is that ain't going to work. Right? And we dug a hole. Right? And we found something that was about four times the ocean at a depth of about um, 50, 60 centimetres. So if we tip some water on that, we know it's going to happen. Okay, uh, that's Forbes. That's Forbes. So that's the same salinity processes we're talking about in a town. Uh, what's it mean? If, if we build things of porous material in these sorts of saline environments, they last about 10% of their recommended lifespan. So you blow 90% of your dough, okay? Um, What's the per hectare value of that, right? It's not 15 sheep anymore. Um, what's the emotional and community value of that church in Mudgee? They've spent several hundred thousand dollars trying to stop that deterioration getting from there to there, right? They happened to be at the wrong end of the swamp and they built a church on a 
sale on discharge area. But the, emo the community value of that lump of rock and memories is huge, right? Much more than 15 sheep. So, Minister, we talk about salt land, is that all around New South Wales, over time, we see a slow increase in salt affected land. Sometimes it gets really big really quickly and stops. Sometimes the rate of pace slows and sometimes, sometimes sites uh, sufficiently disappear. You can't see the symptoms. But what we've seen for the last 80 years or so is that the area of salt affected land is slowly growing. Right. The damage, when people have tried to cost the damage, what's the damage? They come up with numbers. The biggest number is what it does to our infrastructure. Right? Um, there's some big infrastructure items running across the Upper Lachlan, like the Hume Highway Freeway and the main Sydney-Melbourne Railway line and that sort of stuff. Damages them. Um, ecosystems get affected, particularly ones low down in the landscape and in, um, in uh, altered landscapes, agricultural landscapes, um, that tends to, we tend to have two places where we have intact ecosystems. Uh, one is along the creek and one is up on the hills where the tractor couldn't get to. Right? So, Minister, I'm telling you all of the ones, the high value biodiversity assets that are lower in the landscape are under threat from salinity. And finally, it does impact agricultural production. Right? Um, and they're in order. Maybe that suggests why we don't spend too much time on it because the damage to agricultural production is one of the minor costs. What do we try and do about it? Well, we try and reduce the spread of the sites, both in how many they are and how big they are. We try and reduce the on-site and off-site impacts. That's pretty tricky. Um, and a lot of the time, people try and revegetate them. They try and get things growing on them. Why do you think people try and do that? Why do we try and grow things on salt patches? Any ideas? Pump out the water. Yep, nature's pumps. Exactly. Exactly. And we also try and think about where that water's actually coming from. Right? This is putting the band-aid on. What are we going to do about what's actually causing the problem? Okay, second issue, Minister, if you're still with me, is concentration. There are parts of the landscape, depending on the rock and the dirt, where the creeks are pretty salty. And a lot of the time they look like this in the summer to late autumn. And then guess what happens when we have 50 mils of rain? All that salt goes at once. We get these pulses of salt. So it changes in time. So this is a situation where that creek has a certain salinity for most of the time. For a short period of time, it much has a much higher salinity. Getting some nods there, people understand that? Getting a pulse of salt going down this. Yep, good. And that's, if we draw, draw a simple graph, this is a creek near Cowra. This is the concentration level of salt in the water. Sorry, down here. And this is the flow in that creek. Flow, salt. And so you can see some pretty simple patterns where you get big flow, freshens up, right? And then it comes back. Big flow freshens up. This is the Turon River at Cephala. So again, salt number, right? Flow. And this is just for last year, January to December. Why are those dips yeah, what do you think they are? Why? Why do you think they are? Not much difference in flow. Hmm. I think they're the salty creeks turning off for a while upstream. Right? The salty contributing ones. It could also be... A stick got in the meter. <laughs> and having a long, long history of work in the public sector, we'd back the stick every time. <laughs> um, yeah, you hear on TV, here on the radio, oh, the Murray's getting salty, it's terrible, it's terrible. The water quality for Adelaide might be terrible. They're really worried that the water quality for Adelaide might get to 300 EC. Right? Turon River, always above. 300 EC. So what happened in November? I think, I think the, uh, the big storms came and totally wrecked the gauging station and the, the, the salt number dropped. Yeah. Probably burnt down. 
probably burnt down. Or the power source for it probably burnt down. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Okay. We also talk about parts of the landscape where it's always salty. That is Bogan Dillon Creek. It drains the Gemalong irrigation system between Forbes and Condoba. Um, and it always runs salty, like about a third seawater. Uh, I haven't got the picture, but um, I used to have a dog used to go with me everywhere. He wouldn't drink that creek. Too salty for a brown dog. So, Minister, what is salinity concentration? It's high concentration water moving through creeks and rivers. And we talk about that in the context of time. For example, a creek might always be salty just after 50 mils of rain. Or Bogan Dillon Creek is always salty. Right? Time or location. Um, it also damages infrastructure, ecosystems and agricultural production. It particularly impacts point source water users, irrigators, urban water supplies and industry. Cowra, the town of Cowra manages the spikes of salt coming down the Lachlan. Uh, it got, was finding that a problem about 20 years ago, so it built more town storage, right? Because it knew that spike of salt that went down the river would take about four days. So they built six days of storage. Right? So when the good water's there, they grab it and let the other water be someone else's problem. On my, irrigation, my nanny's irrigation farm near Canoundra, we know the spikes go for about 36 hours. What's the time? 10, 10? 10 minutes to go. Thank you. Um, so we, we just don't pump that day. We let it be someone else's problem. Okay? So if you... So some... Um, People can take action and dodge the spikes, right? But if you're a wetland, if you're a, a back plain ecosystem, you don't get that choice. You get the spike. If you're a platypus living in the river, you get that spike. So what do we do? We can dilute them. If you've got, and we do this in both the uh, Macquarie and the Lachlan, we designate chunks of water in the major storages to dilute salty flows. We turn on the tap at Wyangla when the salty water comes out of the Boorawa. Okay? Only works if you've got a big bucket and a tap. <laughs> right? Um, you can dodge them. That's what we do. Right? Platypus don't get to dodge. Um, saline discharge management is a very important part of this. If we put plants back on salt areas, then the salt doesn't leave in a rush. The salt will still leave but over a much longer time, right? So we won't get that big salt of high concentration. Right. Yeah? yeah? Um, so the plants that you would consider using, are there some that would be more um, suitable to There are books. But, but just to take the salt out of the system and actually put it into the plant itself. Yep, they're called yeah. halophytes. Okay. Yep, not many of them. Right. Yep, and most of the time they die and drop the salt back down. Yeah, but they can be a very important part of the system. Salt bush is one. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Third, third issue, Minister. Hang with me. We're nearly there. I promise you that kid will be back with a latte in a minute. Um, salt load. Right. Working on an irrigation farm between Forbes and Condoblin. The blue dots are when they turn their pumps on. Using relatively fresh water out of the Lachlan River. Got a bit of salt in it. Every time they put on a couple of megs of salt per hectare, couple of megs of water per hectare, they put on a couple of hundred kilos of salt per hectare. Right? So five pumping events, the most they put on was 360 kilos of salt per hectare. Did it five times in that irrigation season. If we map it a different way, put on about a certain paddock, we put on about 400, then a couple of weeks later we put on about another 200. So you end up with over the scale of the season, we've put on nearly two tonnes of salt in that particular year, okay, per hectare. Um, and does all that salt sort of stay in the soil or is so it that it's actually the same sort of salt because it recharges into where you get your irrigation water released to something? Yep, and no. So your management of where that salt goes is totally up to you. Are you putting it on the vineyard that I'm a business partner in? Um, we irrigate out of the Balabula River. In 1516, we put on two megs of water per hectare, and the water quality was about 500 EC, so pretty good for the Balabula water. It would cause major changes in policy direction if the Murray ever went to 500 EC. 
Um, that meant we put on 640 kilograms of salt per hectare that year. Next year, it's a bit drier. Have to put on a bit, bit more water and the rivers change dramatically. It's doubled in concentration. So we put on 1760 kilograms per hectare per year. Right? Now to answer, your, to tease out your point, on a vineyard, we irrigate this bit. So we're not actually irrigating a hectare. Right? We're irrigating a third of a hectare. Right? If we put that same load on 1,000 acres of cotton, different outcome, depending on soil type and management. Okay? Overloading of agricultural soils, the first people to do this really, really efficiently were the Sumerians. Okay? That's why you drive through the deserts in the Tigris-Euphrates Valley to see their old cities. That's what they did. They put too many kilos on for too long, so the soil stopped working. And they went through this whole thing about used to grow wheat, ended up growing barley because it's more salt tolerant. Then no more Sumerians. <laughs> okay, so minister, salt load, large volumes of salt moving in creeks and rivers, usually at a low concentration, right? That's why the irrigators are pumping it. It's lots of salt moving in lots of water. So by our management at a farm scale, but also at a catchment and LLS scale, we're partitioning that load, right? And the, the plant that we're all wearing, the, the great fellas in the cotton industry in the lower Macquarie Valley, they're parking a lot of this for us. And if they didn't put it on their paddocks, it would go straight in to the wetland system at the bottom of the Macquarie. Okay? So as a, as a whole landscape, we are partitioning that load in what we do day to day. Um, it's a relatively slow process. It's long. The Sumerians didn't disappear overnight, but they're gone. Right? And the dudes who started doing it on the fringes of the Nile floodplain, they're also gone. Right? <clears throat> what do we do about it? We try and leave the load where it is. We try and leave it diffusely through most of the landscape rather than putting it in a wetland or into a cotton farm. We think about where we park the salt while we address the water balance. Right? This big load that's moving around is a symptom of that water balance thing we started the talk with. Right? Are we okay with parking most of the load on our best soils in the Macquarie Valley? Apparently we are, because that's what we're doing, right? And, and, it's, and it is saving the Macquarie marshes from big loads of salt going in them. But to turn it off at the source, we have to reduce recharge. We have to stop the water going in, grabbing that salt, pushing it out, getting it into the creek, sending it down the system. Okay? Complicated story. Complicated story. Right, if you forget everything I've said in the last 35 minutes, um, go home and Google East Bay, New South Wales. The corporate knowledge of all the soil scientists and water scientists who have done salinity work and soils work in New South Wales is stored in a user database called East Bay. It's a pretty simple system to get into. You click in, it's a Google map. You find where you are and then say, I want to see the soil map for here click up it comes you click on the soil map it says right you happen to be in the Frank Jones soil landscape this is its characteristics and here's a 16 page book about it okay um, we couldn't tell you that two years ago it's only new right uh, and so that's where our soils and hydrology information Nikos can talk about that a bit later right so to finish so landscapes seem to work when our future so, so our future land use systems should display lots of perennial plants, high diversity of plants, healthy soils. It's that simple, right? The rest of the stuff is just incredibly fascinating to geomorphologists, but the driver is lots of perennial things, diversity of species equals diversity of water use, healthy soils, right? Time for a cuppa, all questions. Why don't, why don't we have a cuppa and you come and ham hammer me about questions because I don't have to talk in the next session. Two minutes. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. So irrigation is putting more salt into the soil. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And it's sort of holding it there and stopping it getting in, in most, in, in, uh, in most, generally, most of the time it stays on the farm. And it's slowly getting worse on that farm. Yep. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So it's slowly...
changing the soil characteristics to becoming more salty. So and I see Yes, yes. For, for example, so the numbers I showed you were uh, irrigating at my place, 500 EC water um, to 1100 EC water. Most of the irrigation that's ever done in the Murray irrigation system, right, all the dairy farmers at Collie Amberley and that sort of stuff, 150 EC. They mainly irrigate with fresh water, incredibly. So therefore, much lower loads going on. Right. Geologically, it's depleting. We've probably only got about another 5,000 years to go. <laughs> Enormous salt stores. Enormous salt stores. But it must be measurably going down somewhere. If it's measurably, it's measurably tinily going down, right? Because the landscape in, in Eastern Australia has an enormous ability to either shed fresh water or to store water, right? meaning that we don't liberate all the salt that's there all the time and there's more turning up every day. And it's coming from rocks? It's coming from mainly, mainly sea spray. Oh, really? Mainly sea spray. Occasionally rocks and occasionally, particularly in your situation, rocks that are full of pretty recent sea spray. So mm. What's that? But the icebergs melt, it would become less of a problem. No way. Because the sea would become less saline. Would become less saline. No, that's, <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's <laughs> In 5,000 years' time, after we deplete our current salt store. Yeah. The general sort of physique guy says that planting trees is the yep. best way of yep. doing things, but isn't there an argument that perennial pastures are actually better? Than doing that? Horses for courses. Horses for courses. Uh, we'll spend a lot of time talking about that. The ability of a perennial plant to use water is a tiny bit about the species and mainly about the management, right? The fact that you had a lot of runoff recently tells you that the way that the ground cover had been managed had shut the door for water to go in and it wasn't able to respond quickly, right? If the same amount of rain fell on a grassland that was this high, it was mainly green leaf, totally different outcome, right? So some of the examples I'll show later on are where farmers have made salinity go away by changing grazing management. Bit about the species, mainly about the way sheep and cows see them. Um, do they? Um, it is, it is, yeah. Yep. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Yep. Um, I suppose from a raw hydrologist point of view, um, ha a landscape that's in flux has the potential to either use much more water or much less. So if we remove a vegetation system with a fire or with a bulldozer, then what comes next is important, right? And we can influence that. At the same way, uh, some farmers around Oberon got very agitated 30 years ago because their creeks started drying up because, do you want to think about why the creeks might have started drying up at Oberon 30 years ago? Plantation, Plantation timber, yeah. right? Young, young trees use a lot of water. Old trees use substantially less. So it's about, yeah, how, how do you decide what function you want out of that part of the landscape and what can you do to influence it? Hmm. What would nature do? Yeah. Nature would have a very diverse system. Yes. Yep, yeah, and would have the capacity for that to go into flux and for that to cope. Yeah. Hey, when Bob Carr was spending lots of yep. money, did it make a difference? To, to some individuals, yeah, made a huge difference. Yeah. Um, we can. Did, did people we, learn stuff from that? Yeah, that very much so. Yeah, and I suppose the big learnings, the big learnings that uh, that have changed in in our careers is one: this whole complexity of plumbing. 
Eastern Australia is very different to Western Australia when it comes to salt. That, that Capity is very different to Mudgee, which is very different to Wellington, which is very different. And how we can actually describe that. Technologies improve that allows us to map that much better, much more tightly. Um, the other thing that I suppose was that the, the diversity of that, that, the sort of three point plan I put at the end. Um, yeah, yep. More species, more perennials, high diversity, healthy soils. Um, if I start talking about that just before lunch, Annie will have to drag me off here because there are so many ways you can produce food and produce an income for your family and do those things. And I'll, I'll give you a snapshot of them. But that's the design rule. Yeah. And we've become much more... The, the investment that was made then allowed us to explore some of those options and see which ones really worked and which ones had very limited application. So does mining reduce the load here because you're creating a big hole and big... Yeah, it can, it can make a sump. Yep, it can make a sump. It also generates salty water, yeah. most particularly coal mining and gold mining, yeah. particularly geologically are related to highly saline sediments close by, or highly, highly, highly saline ores close by. So things that were happily sitting tens of metres underground are all of a sudden seeing water and, um, and oxygen and it has a different impact in the landscape. The coal mines in the Hunter Valley have a salt trading scheme because they, they generate so much salt in their production system that they have to wait till the hunter's running huge before they discharge it into the river. It's licensed by the EPA and they trade it amongst themselves. What do we reckon a credit was worth the other day? About two million bucks or something. So big dollars between those coal mines about when they're allowed to pump that salt into the river. Hmm. Do you know much about mining? Hmm? Nope. Nope. Somewhere like in that scenario where they've got huge concentrations, some taken somewhere else to just evaporate and become salt. Yeah, like your place? Are you volunteering? No, no. <laughs> but you know, further away somewhere. Oh, like right, to my place. No so <laughs> desert sort of scenario. Oh, all right, to the Radaree's place. <laughs> all right. It's always someone's place. Yeah, okay. Enough. Yep, and you're always making a, you're always yeah. deciding to sacrifice one lean use to allow. Yep. Yeah. Yep. If you look at Google Earth, yeah. look at Walker, you will see it salt evaporation basins in the town, yeah. so that they could float the suburbs on top. I'm right. We better have a croissant. <laughs> 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 I'm happy to. I don't have to talk in the next session. So, hit me now and. Yep. Yeah.